So I'm not going to make plaintiff go, incur expenses for you to go on a fishing expedition with those two witnesses who have nothing to do with the, either party's alleged contempt issues. Good morning. This is the courtroom clerk with the time eight two. At this time, the court will be calling the matter of versus. If you're a part of this action, please turn on your video. Please turn on your audio at this time. Thank you. Here on the record, Your Honor. Good morning. This is the twenty seven fifty. C. Um, counsel, can we have you make your appearance, please? Good morning, Your Honor. Richard Schoenfeld, bar number 6815, appearing on behalf of She is also present by Blue Jeans. All right, and then we have Mr. here in person. Um, you can go ahead and sit down, Mr. Um, I have read everything, and, and I'm going to try to do a favor to the parties, and I'll probably regret it because no good deed goes unpunished. But uh, I'm not happy to be here today on these issues because these are discovery issues and we have a very capable discovery commissioner who handles these. Uh, both parties are seeking criminal contempt sanctions against the other, but this is still a civil case and still governed by NRCP or the Nevada Rules of uh, Civil Procedure. NRCP 26 specifically limits discovery to that which is relevant to the issues in dispute or likely to lead to admissible evidence on the issues in dispute. Um, plaintiffs' concerns regarding the discovery requests that are attached as exhibits filed on September 23rd are valid concerns. And there's more than one way to handle them. I mean, the plaintiff could have just objected and let the defendant file a motion to compel, which he would have lost on, because many of these things are not there. Um, the court has already limited the scope of what's at issue in terms of time frame. Only events that have occurred after October 13th, 2021 are relevant. Also, only matters related to each party's claims for contempt are relative. Um, rather than make you go start over with the discovery commissioner, I'm going to make some specific rulings on these discovery requests. In terms of defendants, interrogatories to plaintiff. Interrogatories 1, 2, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11, no answers needed. They're not relevant to the issues presently before the court. Interrogatory number 7, only fees and costs paid since October 31st, 2021 are relevant and need to be answered. Um, interrogatory number eight, same thing, only from October 13th, 2021. The rest of them are relevant to the issues at hand and should be answered. Um, with regard to defendant's request for production of documents to plaintiff. Um, Mr. can you explain to me why uh, on request number one and two, why are communications with the two mentioned parties relevant to the contempt issues? Uh, I do not have request one and two in front of me. Wait, let me go to them. Let me get up to speed with you. Uh, produce all documents, produce any and all documents or memoranda thereof from May 1st, 2021 to the present of any communication between you why would those be relevant to the contempt issues? Uh, we could uh, obviously limit that to October 13th and later. There was one issue uh, in which had messaged me something and that I had then messaged plaintiff about that and she told me that I had made it up and that it was low even for me to pretend like her mother had texted me those things. Okay, so you have a text from to you. Correct. Okay, so you already have that because, as I thought, is the plaintiff's mother, right? Correct. Okay, so um, I'm not allowing you to get into all communications. A, it'd be overly burdensome, and B, probably not relevant. So those single communication from 
that is to you, then plaintiff can produce any communications that are relevant to that single communication, Mr. Schoenfeld. Your Honor, obviously I'll need to get that communication. Perhaps the defendant can issue a new request and attach that as an exhibit. Yes. So do you understand that? Yes. Send him so that he knows exactly. So any communications between plaintiff and about that communication to you would be relevant. And then same thing, request number two is communications with Monique Martinez-Quiroz. I have no idea who that is. She's the therapist. Okay. So that request number two then would be relevant and needs to be responded to. There's no need for plaintiff to respond to numbers four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 14, and 16. Requests 11 and 13 need to be responded to, but only items after October 13th, 2021. With regard to the depositions, you only get to depose plaintiff one time. Dr. Holland is not relevant to the contempt issues and not relevant to the contempt issues. I'm not going to make plaintiff incur expenses for you to go on a fishing expedition with those two witnesses who have nothing to do with either party's alleged contempt issues. And I think that covers the discovery. Any future discovery issues, either side does need to bring in front of the discovery commissioner. And I'm not awarding either party attorney's fees or sanctions. With regard to plaintiff, defendant's right that there was no meet and confer. And also the wrong rule has been cited by both of you. EDCR 7.60 no longer applies to family court matters. EDCR 5 has been updated extensively and has its own rule. Defendant, same thing, wrong rule. And you did not show that you have met the prerequisites for filing a motion under rule 11 in that the pre-service. So I'm not, each party's going to bear their own attorney's fees and costs on there. And then I'm going to clarify also on the alleged financial claims by defendant against plaintiff. I already previously ruled that defendant had to file and serve an amended counterclaim to put plaintiff on notice of what exactly those claims are that she's being asked to defend against. So if you, I understand all the arguments back and forth. I've reread the transcript. If you want to pursue that, sir, you have to file an amended counterclaim. And then you have to serve it on counsel. And then plaintiff has a deadline once service is made to file the motion to dismiss, which is what I would anticipate being filed or other response of pleadings. No discovery is going to take place on those claims until I rule on the motion to dismiss on the statute of limitations. Based upon the evidence you already submitted on its face, it looks like the statute of limitations has already been fired long before the plaintiff filed her complaint in this case. So let alone you filing your original counterclaim. The counterclaim can relate back to when you filed your original counterclaim, but that's still not going to save you from what appears to be the statute of limitations. But I'll let you both litigate the statute of limitations issue. And just a question. If there are causes of action that came about after the filing of the original counterclaim. I'm not going to take jurisdiction of them. Then you can file those downtown, as we say. Is it better to have the whole thing bifurcated, the financial stuff? You're welcome to file. You've always been welcome to file a civil complaint against her. Well, I just didn't want it to be in the proper court. And what I say when I say the proper court, I don't remember off the top of my head how much money you're talking about. So if it's under the jurisdictional amount, it would go to justice court. If it's over that jurisdictional amount for district court, it'd go to district court. But then you're opening yourself up. You might want to confer with an attorney, sir, because you're definitely opening yourself up to her request for attorney's fees. If it's on its face, A, the statute of limitations has expired on them, or B, that there's no merit to them. So 
Um, I would, it, as a lay person, you should definitely consult with an attorney so you don't get yourself into deeper issues there that you wouldn't know about as a lay person. So I, I recommend before you uh, run amok, amok and get yourself into deep trouble, consult with an attorney on those issues and whether you actually have good claims against her for civil claims. But yes, you can do that. But if you want to file, because you have put her on, at least verbally on notice about um, the allegations she owes you money on the payments, you, you can amend your counterclaim on that it, on that claim, serve her with it, and then that'll give her the opportunity to file a motion to dismiss or whatever other responsive pleading she wants. But until that is taken care of, until I rule on a motion to dismiss, you're not going to do discovery in this case on it. So, Mr. Schoenfeld, any, anything I didn't cover? Your Honor, I do have a question and then a couple of things I'd like to discuss. So the first question is interrogatory number seven, list the dates and amounts of all payments you've made to your attorney in this case, the balances of any amounts still owed to your attorney in this case, and the dates upon which you became obligated to pay said amounts. Um, even with the limitation from October 13th, 2021 to the present, I'm not seeing how that's relevant to the contempt allegations that have been lodged in this case. In the event that the court were to award attorney's fees at that point, I would file the Brunzel affidavit and assert what the fee amounts are, but I'm not I'm not seeing how historical attorney's fees are relevant to the current contempt proceedings. I, I get your argument on that, but it, it's okay for him to ask for that because he's asking for contempt sanctions that may include that. And I think he's argued that he's paid some fees um, and had, uh, even though he's, has, he's been representing himself, I think he's had some fees paid for drafting, it, it looks like. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he drafted everything himself, but it looks like he paid somebody to help with drafting the, some of the motions and stuff like that. So attorney's fees on both sides is definitely at issue for these contempt things. So I think it's fair for him to ask for what she's incurred in fees since October 13th. And, and, that, and I get your point. It may be um, premature, too, because she's going to incur more. And when we get to trial... She's going to be asking for more than it when she answers that right now because obviously she's going to incur more so it may have to be supplemented but i don't think it's it's out of uh, an out of bounds request and then your honor the other issues are, are not on the calendar but last time the court was able to streamline and assist the parties if i may mr refused to consent to a flu shot being administered, notwithstanding that the prior court orders have stated that the party should follow recommendations of the minor child's pediatrician, and the minor child's pediatrician does recommend the flu shot. So that's one issue. Another issue is that last time we were in court, Your Honor ordered that Mr. was to pick the dermatologist and make the dermatologist appointment. He has refused to do so because the dermatologist is claiming that there's a $129 outstanding balance from 2019. Mr. has not posted that on Our Family Wizard, has demanded that this pay 100% of that amount as opposed to 50% of the amount, and has refused to schedule the appointment instead of paying it and then posting it and following the 30-30 rule. Um, the last issue is Thanksgiving vacation. Mr. has... Um, my client is concerned that Mr. is going to take us out of school for extra days as opposed to just the four days where school would be off, and Mr. objects to that. So those are the three issues that I'm hoping the court can address. All right. May I comment? On yeah, that? let's start with the easy one, Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving, uh, there may be a day or two that I would take him out of school to go out of state. My recollection is that last time we were here, uh, Mr. requested that we only need to give 24 hours notice to leave the state. I realize that's a separate issue from whether or not he can be out of school to go on a vacation. Yeah, he, he, I'm not going to let you take him out of school for a vacation unless mom consents. So if she says no, you've got to wait till he gets out for the break, if it's your break. I'm assuming you're saying Monday and Tuesday because I don't know your schedule off the top of my head. Monday and Tuesday are your days anyway, and then he's out Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Correct. Correct. Yeah, you can't take him out of school, though. He needs to go to school unless mom consents. Your Honor? Yes. 
Um, is that a general that a general order because we've had it? Yeah, that's a general order for both of you. Same thing. If mom wanted to take him, it was her year for Thanksgiving or or some other time period. He need, you can't take him out of school for vacation unless you both agree. Because there's also a limit in Clark County School District on how many days they can miss. And with COVID and other illnesses, they may need those days for that. Okay. So and the other issue was a uh, bring your kid to work day type of day. Okay, well, then that would be an excused absence if you do what the school asks you to do ahead of time. Okay. Although, um, I don't know yeah. how that would work with mom. I don't know how it would work with mom's type of employment and my understanding. I don't know if you're working yet or not. Well, it's, or if you're still, if you're working in the same industry, I don't think the, either one of you are taking him to the casino. Yeah, I, I did not take him to the casino. I did. <laughs> I brought him home to do, uh, I do music also. And right. so that's what we did, so. Okay. Well, as long as you complied with that, so it's a, an excused, uh, appropriate, that, that's fine. I, um, I, I would just like to note that took out of school on his birthday, even though I objected. He took him out of school the day before his birthday also, so I appreciate okay. the order. So we're going to clarify that, and that's mutual. Neither one of you are going to take him out of school for vacations or other other things that aren't illness or doctor related without the other parent's written consent on the flu shot. Are you objecting to that, sir? My opinion on the flu shot is um, we had previously agreed before the filing of the complaint uh, that we would not get a flu shot. Not However, I, I'm sure plaintiff has the right to change her mind. While I do think that the flu shot is probably net slightly more harmful than it is good, I'm not going to waste the, the resources here. And it, it can only be so bad, so I'm, I'm just going to give in. Oh, I guess it's okay. going to get a flu shot. Okay, and I'm not trying to tw twist your arm or, or violate your rights, sir, if you do have a dispute on it. I can hear it at the same time as the evidentiary hearing, and then by that time it's going to be moot for this year anyway. But you guys did pick a pediatrician for him, mm -hmm. and he's been, at my remembrance, and I may be remembering incorrectly, is that he's been seeing the same pediatrician for a while. Same practice. Practice. Yes, yeah. So if they recommend it for your son, then, then it, it, there's good reason to follow the recommendations. Um, if you guys have a philosophical disagreement on that issue, I have to hear it and make a determination based upon the specific best interests of your son. We're dealing with that obviously more often now in the last two years regarding the COVID vaccinations. Um, but if you want to, to litigate the issue of the flu shot, we can do that. Um, and then it may be moot until it's time for flu, flu, flu season next year um, because I can't get you in before that. Or you can, if you want to agree to it, that's fine. I'm not. I'm not going to bully you either way. I have to hear evidence if I have to rule on it. Is what I right, mean. right. I, I, I just based upon the criteria that I think would come up at an evidentiary hearing. It, it seems like I'm such a long shot to win that I, I think I should just give in. I, mean, okay. I, I hate to say it any other, uh, you know, another way, but. Well, I just, and I just think that's the unfortunately right the matter. flu shot, and apparently now the COVID shot is something you have to renew because different strains are they they come up with determinations. How do they do that? The CDC on what flu strains that should be. So each year the shot's different. So um, if you're consenting today on the record, then mom can go ahead and get that done. <clears throat> if you're not, if you want to litigate that, I'll set I'll hear that in February. I'll, I'll consent to the flu shot for this year. Okay, so you've got that consent and mom can go ahead and get that done. What's the issue in the Thank dermatologist? You. I'm confused. So the issue is, um, so we do have a procedure for reimbursing expenses. The difference is that this dermatologist invoice that is outstanding precedes the filing of the case. So it's not technically eligible for reimbursement through that procedure. Um, my opinion was that because Ms. refused to carry insurance in 2019 
and I've never seen this, in, it, as far as I'm aware, I've never seen this invoice before in my life that, uh, that Ms. reimbursed the entirety of it. Now, that being said, if she's going to refuse and we're going to go hear evidence, I'm just going to pay it so that our kid can go to the doctor. Okay. So, it's two, an outstanding balance. I, I would say that that, um, whether you guys were still together or not, is a shared expense. Um, or you could just use a different one. I gave you the choice to pick the der dermatologist, right? They only gave us one place. Under so the insurance. Only facility. referral, yes. And even getting that was five trips to the office. And the medical yeah. field is having a, a difficult time. With it <laughs> yes, especially for specialists. And yeah. there's not very many. And then the insurance coverage issues, I, I get that. So um, if I have to make a call on it, I would say that you guys need to share that expense 50-50. Your client agree to pay 50-50 on that, Mr. Schoenfeld? Yes, Your Honor. Two issues. One is that we've already litigated the issue as to whether or not my client had insurance in 2019, so that point is moot. Two, we had informed Mr. at the time of, yeah. sorry, Mr. at the time of Mr. deposition, which was last week, that if he posts it, she will pay half of it. So she does agree to pay half of it. Okay, so let's get that done so we can, obviously there's a reason you guys have a referral for your son to a dermatologist. Yes. So let's get that taken yes, care of. So it does need to happen. I, I would just okay. say that we that we did not litigate whether she had insurance in 2019. I realize that's probably moot, but uh, your your honor, we litigated whether there was money owed from 2019, and the answer was no. Yes, and I I, I don't know all the story. I mean, I'm being asked to do this on the, on the fly, but it seems like it's stopping you from being him to be able to see the dermatologist again, and there's not much choice. If there was 10 other dermatologists you could see, you guys could fight about this bill and see a different one, but right. there's not apparently, right? That's that's how I feel. All right, so we'll clarify that. Um, Mr. Shomo, can you prepare an order from today? Yes, Your Honor. And then um, include those things that he consented on the flu shot, the clarification for both parties on him missing school for vacations and, and other optional of and then the dermatologist bill and then that'll take care of it and hopefully that if you guys have any further discovery just needs to come up file that in front of the discovery commissioner i know they're pretty liberal about granting uh osts too if you guys need it for something quickly um and like i said we have he's relatively new mr um jay young and but he's he's good at that and everybody i like to have discovery disputes initially heard by them so that everybody's treated the same on discovery issues. Understood. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. I, sorry, oh. I have one more question about sure. this. So in, in, the, uh, in the order about uh, issues that were eligible for contempt, uh, the court said that the court would only be hearing issues that occurred after October 13th. Does that mean that there is no such admissible evidence prior to October 13th. For example, if someone were to say prior to October 13th that I'm going to move for this order and I'm not going to follow it and there's nothing you can do about it, I would think that that was, would still be relevant. Okay, but that's testimony you already have from a prior deposition, right? I'm, I'm, it's between I'm... Uh, the end of trial and current date. Okay. Um, there are communications. In, I'm not going to consider events before October 13th, 2021 for contempt itself, but there may be communications between the parents that are relevant, but you already have all those. You don't need them from her, right? There, you guys have been using our family wizard. Mostly. Uh, you have text messages, and you can produce those and, and provide them because NRCP 16.205. Um, Still applies to to you these parties as, as as a custody case. Okay. So you need to disclose if you have text messages, our family wizard messages you want to use to show a pattern, and that may be true of both of you because a lot of it's a lot of the concurrent contempt claims on both sides are communication based stuff. So I imagine there's communication if you want to show there's a pattern, you can disclose those to, to Mr. Schoenfeld and he can do the same. Right. Yeah, pattern or intent. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. That's all I have. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.